Hi everyone, Dr. Ann Auburn here from the Natural Health Improvement Center in Granville, Michigan. I'm here today on a beautiful Saturday recording this lecture, so I won't be able to answer your questions while I'm talking, but please leave your questions in the chat and somebody from my office will get back to you. Today I'm going to be talking about adrenal fatigue. Are you sick and tired of being tired? Then you might have some form of adrenal fatigue and there's many different versions of it and stages of it. So let's get into it and see what it's all about. All right, could you have adrenal fatigue? Do you feel like you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, but you don't have the energy to carry your own weight? You may have adrenal fatigue. Let's look at our adrenal fatigue questionnaire. Are you tired for no reason? Do you feel run down and stressed or even burnt out? Are you having trouble getting up in the morning despite having a great night's sleep? Feel more awake, alert, and energetic after 6 p.m. than you do all day? We call that being wired and tired. Do you need coffee, colas, salty or sweet snacks to keep going or crave salty or sweet snacks? Are you struggling to keep up with life's daily demands? Can't bounce back from stress, illness, or even exercise? Unable to tolerate life's little problems? Irritable or snapping at your friends, family, or work colleagues? Not having fun anymore? Decreased sex drive? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you may have adrenal fatigue. Adrenal fatigue issues are many. As a quick summary here before I get into the details, you can have elevated blood pressure, also elevated heart rate, or later on when it becomes chronic, your blood pressure can be low. You can use up core nutrients like antioxidants, minerals, vitamins. It might make you crave fat, sugar, and salt. Weight gain can also happen because of this. Adrenal fatigue, because of the neurological changes, also changes the brain's responsiveness to taste. Therefore, less healthy foods taste better to the person. It also changes the crosstalk from the abdominal fat to the brain. Fat tissue is a metabolic organ sending hormones and inflammatory messages to the brain this reduces your sense of fullness and increases your sense of hunger, increasing belly fat and restricting weight loss. This can also lead to insulin resistance, and we'll talk about that later. There is good stress. I just want to make sure you understand that. There's adrenal fatigue stress and there's good stress. So let's look at those. Adrenal fatigue stress, maybe you're working hard for something, but you don't really care about it, or it's no longer fun. Good stress might be working hard for something that you love and you're enjoying every minute of it. It's great. You live off of it. So there's a difference there. You need adrenal stress to you know, face up to challenges and things like that, but you don't want it to become chronic and you don't want it to make your life miserable. All right. So let's look at cortisol and adrenal function. Cortisol is a life sustaining adrenal hormone that maintains balance and bodily functions and therefore improves health and sense of well-being. But again, when that stress is sustained and cortisol is too high, that's when there's some negative effects. So what is adrenal fatigue? Adrenal fatigue is a collection of signs and symptoms caused by impaired adrenal function. Most commonly, it's associated with intense or prolonged stress, but it can also arise during an during or after acute or chronic infections or stresses. Its paramount symptom is fatigue that is not relieved by sleep. Of course, there are other symptoms as well. So let's go on and look at this. Adrenal fatigue is not readily identifiable. There's no one single test for it. It's a collection of various symptoms. You may look and act relatively normal yet you live with a general sense of unwellness, tiredness, or just gray feelings. You may feel depressed, but it's not just depression, and you know it inside. It's because you're tired. People whose adrenals are fatigued often have to use caffeine, sugar, chocolate, carbohydrates, and other stimulants to get anything done. Other names for adrenal fatigue? Well, one thing I want you to know is it's not Addison's disease. That's where you don't have enough cortisol or production of cortisol to sustain life. 
that's a severe condition that has to be treated medically. It's not what we're talking about here. This syndrome has also been called hypoadrenia, subclinical hypoadrenia, neurasthenia, adrenal apathy, and adrenal fatigue. Although it affects millions of people, conventional me medicine really doesn't recognize it as a distinct syndrome. But I can tell you that at our office, we've helped a lot of people with this condition. Let me tell you about adrenal fatigue and the stress response. The acute stress response was first described by Walter Cannon in the 1920s. It's a theory that animals react to threats with a general discharge of sympathetic nervous system fight or flight response. So this is where you might feel your heart race or you might feel almost a little super energized inside. Um, it's the response that was later recognized as the first stage of what they call the general adaptation syndrome. It regulates res stress responses among vertebrates, that's beings with um, vertebral columns like humans, dogs, cats, deer, <laughs> whatever, and other organisms. Okay, so how does the stress response affect the adrenal glands? Hans Seeley recognized that adrenal glands are very important because they produce hormones involved in the stress response, also known as fight or flight. Hans Seeley defines stress as the nonspecific response of the body to any demand. The term stress was applied to the general adaptation response. Adrenal glands and the general adaptation response consist of four stages, the alarm stage, recovery stage, resistance, and then lastly, the exhaustion stage. We don't re really want to get there, <laughs> but let's go through these. Alarm phase, this is where the body prepares for fight or flight in response to stress. You see a bear coming your way, you're going to run. Sympathetic nervous system is activated and the adrenal glands are stimulated. Norepinephrine and cortisol are released. That helps you with your blood flow and your heart rate and pumping all that blood around so your muscles can run from whatever you're running from. Of course, that's brought on by a situation where you might be getting yelled at by somebody or you made a mistake at work or um, somebody's upset with you. Now the recovery phase, after a stress is resolved, the body returns to its baseline state. Hormone and neurotransmitter levels come back into balance or they're supposed to come back into balance. What occurs when this doesn't happen? Well, then you can get into the resistance phase. You could call this stage three of adrenal fatigue. This is when the actual threat has passed but is still perceived in the mind and body as real. The cortisol remains elevated, DHEA levels may be normal or slightly low. And by the way, DHEA is a hormone in the cascade of how your body forms hormones that's a precursor to estrogen and testosterone. Both males and females need it. It's important for muscles, connective tissue healing, mental focus, all sorts of things that keep you kind of happy and moving in life. This is where things start to be out of control though, here in this resistance phase. Things are out of balance. It leads to adrenal stress and fatigue being more of a problem and eventually exhaustion. So let's talk about the exhaustion phase. This is where your DHEA levels have dropped. Cortisol levels may now be low. The patient feels exhausted and depleted and will likely have major exercise or activity intolerance. This is adrenal fatigue with exhaustion, and some people might call it stage four adrenal fatigue. So normal versus excessive stress response. A normal stress response is beneficial and essential for survival. You just need it for life. However, when multiple stressors are very strong or chronic, adrenal fatigue occurs. Adrenal gland functions become suboptimal, and following this, adaptations by the neurological, hormonal, and immune systems occur. This is mild to moderate adrenal dysfunction or adrenal hypofunction without complete adrenal failure. So what happens in adrenal fatigue? Adrenal fatigue can wreak havoc with your life. 
In the more serious cases, you may have difficulty getting out of bed for more than a few hours per day. Every organ and system in your body can be profoundly affected. Adrenal fatigue. Let's look at the effects on the rest of the body. Changes occur in your body chemistry, cardiovascular system, exercise intolerance, and even sex drive. Many other alterations take place at cellular levels because of the decrease in adrenal hormones and other uh, nutrients and neurotransmitters and things like that that occur. Your body does its best to make up for underfunctioning adrenal glands, but at a price. Let's look at stress in the frontal cortex. Stress affects the functioning of the neurons in the frontal cortex. That's where you make your executive decisions. It leads to difficulty with decision making and poor decision making. It's just harder to make decisions, harder to get through your day, harder to do what you need to do every day in life. We're always making executive decisions every day, which bill to pay per first, uh, you know, which task to do first during your day, prioritizing everything in your life. 34% of people cite a lack of willpower as a barrier to best health choices. 56% say that for their willpower to improve, they'd have to feel less fatigue and more energy. So these people probably have adrenal fatigue. So this can affect your memory and cognitive function. Acute stress increases cortisol. Chronic stress suppresses mechanisms in the brain, the hippocampus and the temporal lobes. These serve short-term memory functions, therefore affecting cognitive function. Brain fog is really just a code word for adrenal dysfunction. Chronic stress is predictive of higher risk for dementia. So we want to treat this. We don't want to ignore it and just push through in our lives. We want to do something about it. And there's many things that we can do. So stress and cardiovascular disease. There's multiple pathways for increased cardiovascular disease. Increased inflammatory markers can go up, like ultrasensitive CRP, which is a marker for vascular inflammation. Increased fibrinogen, a blood clotting factor. With high cortisol, you also can have central obesity. A lot of times there's advertisements for supplements for this. That's a little bit of dangerous ground because, you know, those supplements aren't always treating exactly what you have. So we have ways to look at exactly what's going on and be more specific about it. But basically this is tied in with insulin resistance. Your insulin just isn't working the same to get that sugar in the cell and to keep the blood sugar in the bloodstream normal. And again, we mentioned increased blood pressure and heart rate and decrease heart muscle electrical stability. A lot of people will get heart palpitations, runs of fast heart rate, and some people could even be more susceptible to atrial fibrillation and irregular heart rhythm that can be dangerous and cause blood clots. Eventually, the stress could cause low blood pressure, but that occurs later. Chronic stress is associated with increased cardiovascular events over a five-year period, according to research. Also, adrenal fatigue can impact on gut health. With high stress, there is decreased blood flow to the gut. The gut is really lined with all kinds of blood vessels and lymphatics and other things to keep it healthy and to utilize the food that's going through your digestive system. There are changes in the intestinal environment and the beneficial bacteria. You've heard of the microbiome. It can actually change that when you have too much stress. Bowel dysbiosis or an imbalance in the good and bad bacteria and the things that are going on in the gut is increased with excessive emotions of anger and fear. And those are just another form of stress. Decreased secretory IgA can be another problem. This is a marker that tells us how well your immune system is functioning in your gut. We have special stool analysis kits that can tell us where your secretory IgA is at and if your microbiome is balanced. Also decreased willpower, cravings, and poor food choices. This can lead to gut issues as well. There are decreased levels of stomach acid and pancreatic digestive enzymes in a stress situation that has gone on too long as well. Also reproductive function can be affected by stress. Hormone issues are more common. Uh, this can include no periods for women, heavy periods, 
irregular periods, and infertility. And the infertility can also affect the guys, even though they're not having periods, they have hormones also. And if you're not making enough DHEA, DHEA is the major precursor to male testosterone. Also, you can have poor thyroid function, which can also affect fertility issues. Mood and stress. Hypervigilance is really a type of anxiety, and that anxiety is stress. Depression is also a type of stress. Chronic stress depletes dopamine, the neurotransmitter of happiness and satisfaction. Eventually, this can cause a wired and tired feeling, especially in the evenings, causing poor sleep patterns and altered circadian rhythms. Those are the rhythms of kind of doing things during the day, getting things done on a daytime schedule when things are, when it's light out, and then the body calming down when it's darker and getting into a deep sleep and repairing and recovering for the next day. Immunity. The repeated and chronic stress exposure from adrenal fatigue can cause chronic immune system stimulation and eventually suppresses cellular immunity, leading to immune dysregulation. Ultimately, this can cause dysregulated apoptosis. This is programmed cell death. All of the cells in your body kind of in groups are sort of uh, going through their lifespan, dying, and then being replaced. This normal uh, function is apoptosis. And if it's not happening like it should, that's abnormal and therefore potentially leading to cancer or other dysfunction of cells. And it can turn on the immune switches for various autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, lupus, etc. And I have actually seen this happen in my practice. What causes adrenal fatigue? Well, that's a loaded question. There's a lot of things that happen there. The adrenal glands mobilize your body's responses to all stressors through hormones that help you handle the stress. Adrenal fatigue occurs when your adrenal glands cannot compensate for excessive stress. Whether you have an emotional crisis, a physical crisis, or any type of severe, repeated, or constant stress in your life, if your adrenals cannot compensate, you're likely to experience adrenal fatigue. A fact that we know from research is that 75% of all Americans have moderate to severe stress. This is something we need to work on in this country to improve our health in general. In short, adrenal fatigue occurs when the amount of stress or combined stresses overextend the capacity of the body mediated by the adrenals to compensate for and recover from that stress. Once this capacity to cope and recover is exceeded, some form of adrenal fatigue is likely to happen. Now, I wanted to just share with you a few of my favorite books on adrenal fatigue and chronic fatigue. All of these books have a little bit different twist on, you know, different things that affect it, how you can, you know, handle it. Uh, one of my favorites is Adrenal Fatigue, the 21st Century Syndrome um, by James Wilson. Um, and then you can see the other titles there, Revive um, and Chronic Fatigue Unmasked. Also, Dr. Crook in his book, The Yeast Connection, talks about, you know, feeling sick all over, and this is going to create a version of adrenal fatigue. So handling any yeast overgrowth or candida overgrowth is important as well. And then Epstein-Barr virus is, um, you know, it's a virus that causes colds, but also causes mono. You don't have to have mono for it to become a chronic viral issue. Um, and in the book by Kasha Kynes, The Epstein-Barr Virus Solution, she talks about many things that would address adrenals, but also address handling and keeping the virus under control so that you can regain your health. And then in the book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, this explains how you know we as humans don't act like the animal kingdom and recover from our stresses. We just take on repeated stresses and repeated stresses over and over again, and that end up ends up causing you know the alterations in the gut and the various parts of the body, and eventually can cause ulcers or chronic adrenal fatigue syndrome symptoms. So I just wanted to share those interesting books books with you. Also, I wanted to explain everybody is different. There are some people that can take stress after stress after stress or work a very high stress job. And they seem to just tolerate it their whole life. They might even 
kind of like live off of it. They love it. But one person may withstand the stress quite easily and be ready for more, but another person or that same person at another time may find the same stress overwhelming and impossible to bear. It kind of creeps up on you. So it's important to understand the onset and continuation of adrenal fatigue does have great individual variation. So if you're a spouse of somebody who is experiencing adrenal fatigue, try to be understanding because it's a long road to get back to baseline and it takes a lot of work and it's not like they're just faking it. They really are having some chemical changes in the body that we need to fix. So who's susceptible to adrenal fatigue? Well, anyone can experience adrenal fatigue at some time in his or her life. Um, experiences like illness, a life crisis, or continuing difficult situation can drain the adrenal resources of even the healthiest person. But there are factors that make you more susceptible to adrenal fatigue. So let's look at those. Certain lifestyles with chronic stress, no exercise, chronic illness, repeated infections, candida overgrowth, mycotoxin illness, that's mold susceptibility, mold illness, Epstein-Barr virus, we're really talking about the chronic reactivated EBV that Kasha Kynes speaks about in her book. Pregnancy can be one of those stresses, especially the postpartum where you're getting used to having a baby waking you up several times per night. That's why we want to prepare our patients for pregnancy so they're in the best situation before they have their kids. Malabsorption and maldigestion, in other words, leaky gut, that can also set you up for you know, a case where you might have worse adrenal stress, hormonal imbalance, or toxic exposures. Lifestyle factors contributing to adrenal fatigue that are mostly under your control are lack of sleep. A lot of people stay up late when they really shouldn't. Um, they don't let themselves have the, the time to, you know, get adequate sleep or have a good situation in their house where they can sleep well poor diet. You know, we all make choices. We want to stay away from processed foods, white flour, sugar, um, you know, it, lack of fruits and vegetables, lack of good raw foods, low fiber, all of these can contribute. Using sweet or salty food and sweetened or caffeinated drinks as stimulants when tired, staying up late even though you're tired, feeling and acting powerless, constantly driving yourself under pressure, substance abuse, staying in no-win situations, and too few enjoyable and rejuvenating reju activities. You have to have those in your life. So examples of life events that may lead to adrenal fatigue include frequent crises at work or at home, hating your job, severe emotional trauma, death, divorce, etc., major surgery, prolonged or repeated infections, serious burns, head trauma, job loss or change in financial status, relocation with no support, excessive chemical exposure. Uh, let me give you some examples of people with lifestyles that may make them more vulnerable to adrenal fatigue. A full-time university student, it's going to be worse with the job. Mother with two or more children and little support. Single parents. Unhappy married person. Employees in a poor job situation, self-employed person struggling with their business, substance abuser, shift worker on an alternating schedule. It's very hard on the body to go from day shift to night shift. A person who is all work and little play. So you can see those different th things that might set you up for adrenal fatigue. Also, some health conditions might be related to adrenal fatigue. Any chronic disease will place demands on your adrenal glands. If you have a chronic disease and morning fatigue, your adrenals may be fatigued to some degree. Also, if you require steroid meds, you probably have at least some decreased adrenal function. Now, sometimes we do use hydrocortisone, also known as Cortef, when we have severe adrenal cases, but we do try to get our patients off of those eventually. But those are different than the higher dose heavier steroids like prednisone and methylprednisolone. All corticosteroid medications are designed to imitate the actions of the adrenal hormones and cortisol. 
How common is adrenal fatigue? Well, John Tentera, MD, he was a specialist in low adrenal function. In 1969, he took a look at this and he thought 16% of the public could be classified as severe. But he looked at it again and he thought, well, if all the conditions of low cortisol were included, the percentage could be more likely about 66%. This was before the extreme stress of the 21st century living, 9-11, and the stress of COVID-19 and the various other disasters that we now know are all over the world all the time with the internet. We instantly know about earthquakes. We instantly know about hurricanes. You know, there's this, uh, it's a good thing that we can communicate more, but with that instant information, you know, one of the things I tell my patients is please don't watch the news or listen to every, you know, horrible thing that's happening all over the world all the time, If, especially if you're in adrenal fatigue or if you're an anxious or stressed person, it's just going to make it worse. So how do we test for adrenal fatigue? We have a saliva kit that we use. It's very easy and accurate. Blood testing is a lot less accurate. In fact, the blood test is really not worth the time or money, in my opinion, because it doesn't really tell us the whole picture and it can be inaccurate. The saliva test is done at home. It measures the levels of the stress hormones, cortisol and DHEA four times throughout the day. And it provides an evaluation by looking at it throughout the day, how the levels will differ from the morning to the evening. So here's a picture of a adrenal stress profile. This is the one from Genova. Um, we have another one from another lab. They're very, very similar. It's measured in four samples throughout the day. Um, you just collect saliva in a test tube four times in one day. The DHEA is measured along with the cortisol in the morning sample. And then once the sample set is complete, you just mail the tubes back into the lab. It's all set and ready to go. You just label it and there's a number that you call to have it picked up. Your doctor will receive the copies of the results and then you'll wanna sit down with them and talk about them. So is saliva testing for hormones reliable? Yes, I've seen it many, many times pinpoint the areas of the day that the person is having problems. It really is accurate. And the NIH, National Institute of Health, does recognize saliva cortisol testing as being very accurate. Cortisol and adrenal function. So let's look at this again. What is cortisol going to affect in you know, the, a stress situation? It'll affect blood sugar. It affects gluconeogenesis. This is the process of making blood sugar from stored fats or proteins in the liver or kidney. It affects the immune responses, as we've said. It affects anti-inflammatory actions in the body, blood pressure. I've mentioned that several times heart and blood vessel tone and contraction, central nervous system activation. We do need it for life. We just don't want it to be overstressed. Cortisol levels normally peak in the morning and reach their lowest around 4 a.m. It's vital for the adrenals to secrete more cortisol in response to stress, but cortisol levels must return to normal afterwards. Health problems result from too much circulating cortisol all the time and or from too little cortisol if the adrenal glands become completely depleted. I'll uh, um, give you an example, like people talk about high cortisol causing weight gain. Well, that's true, but you can also have weight gain with low cortisol because your body is under-functioning, the metabolism is lower and things like that. So again, this is a value of the saliva test. You can really tell if it's high or low, then we get you the right treatment, not just you know a treatment that's designed for high cortisol, which is basically all those products you see out on the, on the market, advertised on TV and the radio. So we, we can be more specific with our adrenal cortex stress profile. With this picture, you can see the person is very high in cortisol in the morning, kind of normal high at noon, then they're high again in the afternoon and kind of normal at night. In this picture, if you look down at the middle bottom, it's a little bit blurry, but the DHEA is in the green range. They're still doing okay there. So this would be kind of early in adrenal stress. Then as it continues, if stressors continue over and over again, you can see your DHEA down there in the middle is just to the left of the green box. And now you've got low cortisol in the morning and high cortisol all throughout the day, even at night when it's supposed to be low so you can get to sleep. And then in this picture, you can see now the curve is flattening down. It's kind of, you know, sort of in the bottom green range, you know, top of the yellow range there. 
The DHEA is actually low now. You can see it's kind of in the red box. This is kind of a danger sign. We want to re reverse this as much as possible and as soon as possible. Um, and then there is this picture where it's similar, but you've got sort of a hike in the cortisol midday, but you're starting out very low and they're kind of in the green range, sort of normal range um, in the uh, afternoon and evening. And in this picture, you can see uh, the DHEA is very low in the red range. That means you're getting into the later stages of adrenal fatigue. So prolonged levels of elevated circulating cortisol have negative effects. Brain fog, dampened thyroid function, hyperglycemia, that's high blood sugar, osteopenia and osteoporosis, that's your bone loss, insomnia and fatigue, decreased muscle mass, high blood pressure, immune dysfunction and slow wound healing, uh, increased abdominal fat. Uh, chronically low levels of circulating cortisol are also associated with negative effects, such as, again, brain fog and mild depression, low thyroid function, hypoglycemia, fatigue, especially morning and mid-afternoon. I call these the two o'clock tireds. My patients have probably heard me say this many times before. That if you get the two o'clock tireds, there's a very good chance you have adrenal fatigue, sleep disruption, low blood pressure. And, and again, um, when you're in the earlier stages with that high cortisol, it can be high blood pressure, um, lowered immune dysfunction, inflammation. And there's health conditions related to adrenal fatigue. Um, if you're suffering from chronic disease, as I said earlier, uh, and morning fatigue is one of your symptoms, your adrenals may be fatigued to some degree. We just have to figure out how much by doing our test and or talking to you. It, the test is better, but if you know some of my patients can't afford the test, we just talk in great detail about how they feel morning, noon, afternoon, and night, and sometimes we can nail it with that, although I think the test is better. Again, health conditions and adrenal fatigue. Remember, alcoholism, other addictions, food allergies, environmental allergies, autoimmune disease, uh, syndrome X, which is your insulin resistance, obesity, and hypertension. This is why it's important to pay attention to your diet and exercise. That's the core of everything that we do. Um, chronic fatigue, chronic recurrent infections, dental problems, including multiple cavities, gum disease, et cetera. Hormone imba hormonal imbalance, like polycystic ovarian syndrome, even PMS and amenorrhea, which is where you don't have periods, or menopause, where you're losing all your hormones, that can set you up. Also, a lot of my patients ended up with adrenal fatigue after they hit menopause and their body just didn't have the reserve to handle the stress that they were putting on themselves or that was coming into their life. Also, fibromyalgia, that's a chronic condition that can set you up. Gut imbalances, if your gut isn't working right, this is another core, very core part of integrative and functional medicine. We need to make sure your gut is functioning well and sleep disturbance. So as holistic practitioners, we're going to look at all those things. You know, we're not going to just do a test and give you supplements. Our goal is not to just sell your supplements. We want to get you well. We want to get you healthy. We want to get you back to your maximum potential naturally as much as possible. So again, I want to emphasize food and treating adrenal fatigue. It's very important to make better food choices when you're dealing with this. Uh, from James Wilson's book, The 21st Century Syndrome, I love this quote, even in the best of times, you need food to survive and be healthy. Adrenal fatigue is definitely not the best of times. And so the food choices you make become even more important to your survival and health. And that is so important in so many things that we deal with at our, our practice but adrenal fatigue for sure. So food and treating of adrenal fatigue, let's summarize. These are James Wilson's nine easy rules to follow. Eat a wide variety of whole natural foods. Combine a healthy fat, protein, and complex carbohydrate at each meal. Eat lots of vegetables, especially the bright colored ones. Salt your food to a pleasant taste and use sea salt. Some patients are so fatigued that putting a little salt in their drinking water also helps them to maintain some good, some better adrenal function. Um, one thing I will say is I do feel like uh, if you get protein in the morning for adrenal fatigue patients, it does seem to help them and adequate protein throughout the day. 
Um, eat mainly whole grains. If you're going to eat grains, we are very careful about grains in our teachings at our practice because we know gluten, which is in wheat, barley, and rye, is not always the healthiest for almost anyone, but especially for those dealing with chronic illness. But if you're going to eat grains, make sure that they're whole grains, like whole oatmeal, whole quinoa, you know, breads, pastas, and all the various, you know, cookies, cakes, pies, and things like that. They're fun to have once in a while, but you don't want to be doing those on a regular, regular basis unless, uh, you know, you are super fit and you can handle it. For vegetarians, make sure to combine grains with legumes or legumes with seeds or nuts to form a complete protein. And also vegetarians, I do encourage people to do, you know, some fish maybe or some eggs. Uh, otherwise, you may be lacking protein. And we want to make sure to check their B vitamins, especially B12, to make sure they're not deficient in that. Avoid fruit alone in the morning because it's just a carbohydrate. You're going to run out of gas in about an hour and then feel tired. Also, mix one to two tablespoons of fresh essential oils in your food throughout the day. It can be in the form of avocado, uh, flax seeds, or it can be the oils like cold pressed olive oil is fantastic. Um, it's not great to cook with though, so I prefer avocado oil to cook with. It's more stable at high heat. But um, if you mix these into vegetables, meats, and grains daily, this will give you some good fat um, energy to live off of and eat high quality food. It becomes you. Also, I wanted to give you a little summary of foods to avoid. Of course, you probably know most of these, the white foods, sugar, flour, pasta, potatoes, rice, even the whole grain brown version should be limited to one to two servings per day, hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated oils, um, deep fried foods, um, there's toxic free radicals in them. So very minimal, if any at all, really in a, an adrenal fatigue situation, I would say don't eat any fried foods, um, fast foods and junk foods. You know, they're just not as clean. They have more toxins in them. You want to do a, as much clean food as possible. And the act of eating, let's talk about that real quickly too. You want to have a situation where you can eat in peace how you eat can have a great effect on you and your adrenal glands. So you want to have some control over your eating environment. You want to choose a peaceful spot with pleasant surroundings, congenial conversation, and good company. And this promotes relax and relaxation and digestion. What you're really promoting is uh, parasympathetic nervous system function. We call the parasympathetic nervous system the rest and digest system. It helps you to heal and repair. Whereas if you have sympathetic overdrive, that's the excessive heart rate, high blood pressure, using up all your blood sugar, all of that sort of thing. That's not good for adrenal fatigue situations. And it's really not good for general health either. So eat your food sitting down in a relaxed position. Do not rush meals. Chew your food very well. You'll be getting more out of it. All right. Um, summary of liquids to drink. So on the liquids, you want to drink lots of water, pure, clean spring water or filtered water is best. If you're going to drink reverse osmosis water, what I recommend is people get pH protector drops um, and they put those minerals back in the water. Uh, again, many people feel better if they slightly salt their water, especially in the morning, because that helps adrenal fatigue people. Other things that seem helpful but are not overstimulating are green tea, um, especially organic would probably be best, bancha tea, also herbal teas that do not have caffeine. So we kind of avoid black tea because that does have quite a bit of caffeine. Also vegetable juices. Um, these are great. I don't want you to go excessive on the um, carrot juice or beet juice because those do contain, contain a lot of carbohydrates and can raise your blood sugar. So uh, you can have a little bit of that, but mix it with some greens. If you have your own juicer, it's really great if you can just make it fresh because if you drink it within 20 minutes of making it, it's not going to be oxidized. You're going to get the most nutrition out of it. Also, goat's milk is more digestible than uh, you know cow's milk. It's similar to human milk. It's lower in lactose. Um, some of our patients can't tolerate that either, so we use milk substitutes. Um, we do do a sensitivity test, and we can tell if people are allergic to goat, sheep, 
and cow milk. And if so, we would do milk substitutes and there's many of those. Also, carob can be used in place of chocolate. Chocolate has a lot of caffeine in it and can aggravate hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, and it can overstimulate the adrenals. So we try not to do a lot of chocolate or just get rid of chocolate and substitute carob instead. Also, um, summary, of, summary of liquids to avoid chocolate, meaning like chocolate milk. <laughs> so many people love chocolate milk. Uh, but it's got sugar in it too, so it's terrible for you. But the chocolate is going to be overstimulating. So caffeine. Um, now, some people can do this in moderation. It really depends on the person. Personally, I think most people can handle one to two cups daily, but some people cannot handle any caffeine at all. If you're one of those people, you know. And caffeine is um, detoxified by the liver um, if you get overstimulated by just one or two cups of caffeine and it keeps you up at night, then we should do a liver detox with you because that means that your liver, your phase two liver detoxification really is not getting rid of that caffeine. It's kind of hanging on to it in phase one. So, you know, again, caution with caffeinated drinks like coffee. Um, you know, if you're drinking a lot of it now, don't stop cold turkey. You're going to have a terrible headache. Just go half caffeinated and then slowly pull yourself away from that and then start introducing the things that I mentioned earlier. The green tea has some caffeine in it, but it doesn't make you crash after it um, wears off. Um, so there's substitutes. Um, also alcohol. I really should not be consumed by people suffering from adrenal fatigue because it's just going to make you worse. It's just kind of like sugar. It's going to deplete you. It's hard on your liver, especially we do not want people with adrenal fatigue drinking every day. <laughs> that is absolutely a no-no. But if you can get rid of it totally, that's what you should do while you're in the healing phase. Later on when you're doing great, you can maybe have a glass you know, once or twice a week and see how you do. Soft drinks are also a huge no-no. Soft drinks, whether they're sugared, those are the worst, but also the ones with the artificial sweetener, those are usually terrible as well. They contain caffeine and phosphates. Now, one exception is Zevia, maybe not the Coca-Cola version, um, but Zevia has many carbonated flavors and it's sweetened with Stevia, which is a very safe sweetener, totally fine for. I want to give you a few tips on how to de-stress using the acronym from Dr. Jim Wilson. Define what is important and decide to live accordingly. Energize yourself with good foods and exercise. And you gotta be careful with exercise because we don't wanna overdo it with adrenal fatigue. Support your bodies with supplements. So we'll talk about those more in just a minute. Take time to relax and enjoy. Reframe events that stress you in order to release yourself. If you're in a situation that you don't really like, sometimes if you take a few deep breaths and you look at it differently, you can sort of think of how this might be a life lesson for you or how you can learn to do it differently in another situation. And then going on, eliminate energy robbers. Sleep and give your body silent solace each day and smile and see the soul fullness in your life. So those are a few tips to help you de-stress. So here are a few adrenal support supplements that would give you energy for those low cortisol levels. Adrena Boost is one of my favorite because it contains licorice root to help you hang on to your cortisol throughout the day. Some people cannot take this if they have high blood pressure or if they're real anxious, sometimes they overreact to it with a little bit of um, feeling overstimulated but most people do quite well with it. This is one that I took myself as I was going into menopause because that was a big change in my body. It contains almost everything that James Wilson talks about in his book. It's got B5, B6, vitamin C, uh, adrenal glandulars. Um, it's also got uh, um, adrenal adaptogens. So it's a very comprehensive formula to kind of balance adrenal function and boost your energy a little bit. Licorice Plus from Metagenics will do the same, but it's just licorice. So again, those with high blood pressure don't want to take this. But many times if you're on the later stages of adrenal fatigue and your blood pressure is low, as we often see, Licorice Plus can be very helpful for a little boost in the morning. Um, 
aura adren, that's just a, a adrenal glandular. Adrenamine and uh, desiccated adrenal are also glandular. We carry different types because different patients respond to different glandulars. Um, the adrenamine is sort of a combination glandular. It's not just for the adrenals, but also for other supportive organs. And then we have Adreset. Adreset is our um, adaptogenic formula from Metagenics, and that gives you a little boost in the morning and helps your energy. Um, we also have just plain B complex, stress B complex, we call it. And we have from Metagenics, Cortico B5, B6. And then, of course, we recommend that people take a little bit extra vitamin C, at least 1,000 milligrams a day, sometimes 2,000, to help with the adrenal support because the adrenals contain, contain the most vitamin C of any organ in the body. Now, if you're on the other side of the spectrum and you're wired and tired and you can't sleep or you're stressed out or nervous or anxious all the time or even having panic attacks, some of these supplements can calm the adrenals and calm the high cortisols and um, we have Serenogen, which is a product that's an adaptogen, very calming from Metagenics. There's also Calm CP, one of my favorites for sleep, but also it could be very good for anxiety and panic attacks. Travacor is more of a combination formula that has 5-HTP, GABA, and some B vitamins to help your serotonin levels and your GABA levels. So it's kind of nice for that combined uh, anxiety, depression kind of case. Serene is more just for the um, uh, serotonin. It's got 5-HTP and B vitamins to support that. That's very nice for helping sleep, but also for helping mood if you're on the depressed side of things. Um, Ayur ashwag ashwagandha, difficult one to pronounce, but it's a great supplement. I love ashwagandha if you're kind of nervous all the time or anxious all the time, or have that underlying kind of worry all the time. Ashwagandha is very, very gentle. It's an adaptogen. Ours is 300 milligrams, and we usually recommend it three times a day. But if you have somebody who's already really low in cortisol in the morning, you probably wouldn't want to do that the first thing in the morning. You might want to combine it, do it later in the day, and then do um, one of the energizing supplements in the morning. And then we do have just straight GABA also. When you raise your GABA levels, GABA is a neurotransmitter and also an um, amino acid. When you raise the GABA, the cortisol tends to go down lower and vice versa too. When you raise cortisol, GABA tends to go down lower. So they kind of balance each other out. Um, NT Calm is a really nice formula for the really high cortisols and the very nervous or anxious person. It's got a combination of like theanine, uh, GABA. Um, there might be some 5-HTP in there. I don't remember, but that's a real nice combo formula. Copa de Stress is very uh, fast acting to bring down the cortisol levels if you have a anxiety attack or you're just hyper reactive to everything. It works within a few minutes, usually one or two um, dropperfuls. Same with the Nucera, but Nucera is chewable. One note to make here is that Nucera does say that it's got milk in it, but it really doesn't. It's a casein triptych hydrosylate, and that is a fraction of the casein complex in milk but it does not can, contain milk. And actually people that are allergic to milk can take it and I've never seen any reactions. So that's just kind of an overview of some of the uh, supplements we have. We have whole handouts for this at our office if you come see us. And also there are many, many calming herbs and supplements that we can use to help adrenal function. Uh, adrenal support foundational, you always wanna get your B vitamins and your multimineral uh, multivitamin. So we always recommend that a person takes a multivitamin, but you have to be picky about the kind that you use. Uh, you don't want to use the kind that have like calcium carbonate and um, just regular old cyanocobalamin. You want methylcobalamin for your B12. You want methylated folic acid for your you know, B uh, for your folate. Um, so there's little things we can tell on the vitamins, um, and normally we need more support for those who have adrenals, not less. But we have three or four different multivitamins at the office, so we can find which one works for our patients. And then often we are doing a B-complex, or we might measure B12 levels in the blood and see if they need B12 also. And then omega-3s are very, very important. Um, if you are vegetarian, there are omega-3s that are vegetarian. I don't carry them at my office because I think the fish oils work much better. 
Um, but some people um, do go for the vegetarian version, which you can find online. The two most important omega-3s are EPA and DHA, and those make your cell membranes function better. So your messages are getting in your cell to get things working for you in the cell and to get toxins out of the cell. And they're really, really good for your nervous system. And you need that kind of support when you have adrenal dysfunction. Um, now we want to promote healing. So again, use that de-stress acronym to get away from the energy robbers, get away from the bad relationships, establish good relationships, establish clear boundaries and surround yourself with people that make your life better and um, have enriching experiences. Also to promote healing, we want good sleep. Um, you can't see all of my supplements there because my picture's over them, but several of these are like the calming supplements that we have in our repertoire. Um, there's serine, Travacor, Trincor, melatonin, Calm CP is one of my favorites. All of these combined with 100 to 400 milligrams of magnesium can be super helpful. Also meditation, box breathing, prayer, or taking a walk and looking at things for 10 to 15 minutes prior to going to bed can be super important for getting that silent solace and that deep sleep for renewal of heart and mind and for adrenal healing. And you want to smile. You know, even sometimes if you don't feel like smiling, you need to make yourself smile and you will be happier than those who don't. This is something that one of my aunts taught me when I was very young, and it's absolutely true. There's a physical action of smiling that turns on various neurochemicals and um, various um, immune functions in your body. And I think it's very important, even if you don't feel like it, to try and make yourself do it. Watch lots of comedies, have enriching, fun experiences, and remind yourself to laugh, and it will help your healing. Detoxification is also another important piece of what we do for adrenal fatigue. You can see this has many facets because it affects the entire body. Um, you know, we may never be free of toxins, but our goal should be to reduce them to a level that we can live with, that our body can cope with and still function optimally. Um, we have several different versions of detox and you can watch my detox lecture on YouTube if you wanna find out more about that. Also in your adrenal fatigue recovery plan, you wanna include looking at hormones, looking at thyroid, looking at detoxing heavy metals, especially if you've had some exposures and most of us have, um, cleaning up chemicals in your environment, your food, your yard, um, things that you use for your plants and your gardens, looking at candida overgrowth, looking for food sensitivities or allergies and looking for chronic viral disease. And we have treatments for all of those. And lastly, I just want you all to know, never give up. We are here to support you. Um, it can take one to two years to fully recover. There are some cases that are more long-term that you know, we can't get them completely, I wouldn't say healed, but we get them to a point where they can enjoy their life again and they always still have to work at it. But most people, you know, within a couple of years, they are recovered and they're back to more of a normal state. And then we hope we can keep it there by having taught them some of these wonderful new habits for their mind and body. And that's all I have for you tonight. I want to thank you very much for listening. And again, like I said, this is pre-recorded. And I, now I'm going to go enjoy my six-year-old grandson who's come to visit me today. And you all do the same and enjoy this lecture. And if you do have questions, please put them within the chat and my office will get back to you. You can also reach us through our Facebook page. You can also reach us through our website, nhicwestmi.com. And feel free to watch any of our previous YouTube videos and check out our Instagram page. And if you'd like to see us, there's our phone number, 616-301-0808. We'd love to have you as a patient, help you through your health journey. All right, thank you very much and have a good night and good luck with your health. Um, it's a wonderful journey if you decide to take it and we're here to help you. Good night.